How do you deal with rejection? At some point in your life, you have experienced it, and you will experience it again. It's part of life, no matter what age, what your status is. It happens to children when they uh, don't get picked to, uh, in the gym class or get picked kind of last, or when they try out for an athletic team and don't make it. School cliques and groups can be cruel. They often reject their peers. Later on, rejection becomes a part of the learning curve. As, uh, as you mature and begin to uh, date, for example, then it's college applications resulting in not being accepted to the school that you wanted to go to. It's job interviews without landing the job. It's being asked to resign or downright getting fired. It's personal life. It's longing for a lifetime commitment and uh, companionship, sometimes resulting in shattered dreams. It's family life with marital troubles, with seemingly small rejections that sometimes add up to the big one, the divorce. And this rejection is amplified in different ways when children are also part of the picture, when relationships change to such a degree that there's a partial or complete breakdown, and once again, a sense of rejection. Children might feel rejected when parental attention and affection and time spent with them changes. And parents might feel their children rejecting their values by the choices that they make. No one is immune to it. We all have experienced rejection. And dif different people react differently some seem to be able to deal with it better than other people. But no matter who you are, rejection hurts and it wounds. It gets to even the strongest, the tough, the experienced, the mature, the wise, the people of faith, such as St. Paul, in our New Testament text for today out of 2 Corinthians, and we need to understand where Paul was when he wrote the words that were read to you a couple of minutes ago, where he was emotionally, physically, and spiritually when he wrote the letter. He writes 1 Corinthians, and that letter is filled with pastoral problems that he is dealing with, but that one is an optimistic, upbeat message. It ends with the resurrection. There is a, thing, a sense that things are going well. And then 2 Corinthians, well, that's another story. There's darkness, sadness, even depression. A sense of an inner struggle in Paul where he seems to be wanting to just give up. Why is that? Well, he's in Ephesus for two and a half years, and that's a long time for him. He likes to travel around. This is the longest time he's spent anywhere. And as his usual custom, he started with the synagogues, his own people, and then they initially welcome Paul, but then they reject him. So he goes to the Gentiles and starts a mission congregation. And they're filled with joy, and things are going great when Paul is forced to leave because of the situation in Corinth. So somewhere in those two and a half years, probably towards the end, Paul gets a word, a distressing news from Corinth. And he takes a trip across the sea uh, to, to Corinth to deal with the problems there. And... 
what happens is that they don't even let him come in. Paul, the founder of the church, is outright rejected. They don't want to do anything with him. And so, beaten down, tail between his legs, Paul heads back to Ephesus. But when he gets back to Ephesus, the tension with the pagans there is mounting and looks like Paul would have to leave that place. So he's dealing with that and the collapse of the church in Corinth when he writes the second Corinthians, when he writes the words that you and I just listened to. But all throughout the letter to the, the second letter, you can see the ups and downs. Uh, just like us, Paul has his good days. Sometimes he has his bad days. And here in our text, the end of chapter 4 and the verse 1 of chapter 5, see, he seems to have a better day. What gives him hope? It's the resurrection. It's at the center of our faith. Maybe he went back and he looked back at the letter he wrote, the first letter he wrote to the Corinthians and read the, the last part of it and realized that that's the reason I do what I do. He speaks of this slight momentary affliction. And he doesn't give us any explanation what it, what it means. And chances are Paul is suffering from depression. He's struggling with all the pressure that he's been under and the rejection that he has experienced and continues to experience. His was a very unique ministry, as you recall, uh, because that he was preaching to the Jews. He was preaching to his own people. He was a teacher. He knew the stuff, and they knew it too. So he's quoting them the scripture that they know, and he's trying to convince the people that this is the Messiah you've been waiting for, and then... They listen to him, but down the line, they, they reject him. And then he goes to the Gentiles. And to them, what he's telling them, the story, is like a, it's like a story from a galaxy far, far away. And they too, sometimes, just like what happened in Corinth, they reject him. So how does he deal with rejection? How do we deal with rejection how do you deal with rejection more importantly this is a very unique teaching so uh, it was, kind of, was kind of cool preparing for this for this sermon so listen to what he says so we do not lose heart he writes he writes to them he writes to us and he writes to himself don't lose heart don't lose heart he says to himself first and foremost, over what's happening in Corinth, over what's, what's about to happen in Ephesus. It is wearing him down emotionally and physically. He says, our outer nature is wasting away. Our earthly home is destroyed. And what keeps Paul going is the resurrection. The resurrection of the body. And this is kind of an interesting approach because he's not dealing with kind of spiritual stuff, spiritual matter. He's not attacking it from the standpoint, well, let me tell you about the spiritual strength to deal with all those problems. He's actually talking about the resurrection of the body. I think it's a message that we don't often think about. We certainly don't often, I think, preach about it. Because when we teach and preach, we tend to focus on spiritual matters, and rightly so, but a danger lurks there in that we tend to almost square off the spiritual and the physical. And we preach about spiritual life as if it's something disconnected and almost in opposition to the physical life. We take passages like the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak and we say, well, that means that the spirit is good and flesh is bad. But that's not what Jesus meant when he spoke those words and that's not what, for example, St. Paul means when he writes his stuff about his struggles with temptations and the weaknesses of the flesh. There's no separation 
between the physical body and your spiritual, your soul. We have to be very careful with that. And sometimes we tend to think along those terms, especially in the funeral setting, when we speak about death as a release from the prison of the body. And an afterlife is like a spirit that is disconnected from our bodies. But the fact is, the Bible teaches us that bodies and souls are gifts from God. God created Adam and Eve, both bodies and souls, before the fall into sin. Jesus honored our bodies by becoming flesh himself in order to redeem us, body and soul. He subjected himself, body and soul, to God's wrath on the cross so that we might be spared, buried in the tomb, he sanctified our graves with his body, which did not see corruption. Then he rose from the dead, body and all, and ascended into heaven, body and all. Our bodies are honored by God even when those bodies are rejecting him. What Paul is struggling with, what we struggle with, is that when we are rejected, we want to run the other way. And what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, what he is probably saying to the Ephesians, and now to us, let's not lose hope. Let's remember the resurrection, that Christ has died and is risen in a resurrected body, and that is a glimpse of our heavenly destiny. And in that hope of the resurrection... Paul is able to go on. Rejection is, I think, in its essence, a physical thing. We get rejected because of the lack of our abilities. We get rejected because of our looks, our performance, our learning and work habits, our skills, we get rejected because of our age. There's an emotional side of the rejection, but even it manifests, manifests itself in a very physical way with a very real and tangible connection between the emotional and physical health and well-being. You see that in our text. That is what Paul is getting at in our epistle. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Your tent, your body, here is going to fail and fall apart. But that's not the end. You have eternal life in heaven. You have a building from God, and it's not going to be a disconnected soul. A building, not a temporary tent, but a building. Your body is still your body. It's just better. In fact, it will be perfect, better than it ever has been here, free from corruption forever. Your body is redeemed by Christ as much as the rest of you. To kind of dismiss it, to separate it, to scorn it for its weaknesses and afflictions is to scorn what the Lord has created and redeemed. For such things, you and I repent. And you and I give thanks to God that he has created you with body and soul. And that Christ has honored your body by becoming flesh himself. You rejoice that Christ became flesh to redeem you, body and soul, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.